Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Releasing Your Inner Dragon with Drake and Marie. I am one of the hosts, Maxwell Alexander Drake. I'm an award-winning novelist. I teach writing all over the world. I've written in pretty much every medium. As always with me is my co-host, Marie. Hello, my name is Marie Mullaney. I am a fantasy author and I run a YouTube a YouTube channel about fantasy world building. Today in this episode, we're actually going to do kind of a post game show episode. We have finished writing Magic Fall. Um, it's the book that we plotted live and kind of working on. We did have to end up rushing a lot. Um, I had a bunch of stuff jump on my plate and and we just kind of ran out of time. We wanted to get this out for Comic Con. So um We've kind of done a lot of things off uh, or behind the scenes, but today we'll talk about kind of what happened during the production of it, where the plot went and everything like that. But before we get into it, all the usual stuff. You're a writer, you know writers, you need to help us out. You like listen to us or you wouldn't be here. Please like, share, subscribe, tell people about the podcast. We are really getting close to that magical number of, I think it's a thousand downloads a month is that we're, we're yeah. shooting at or is it? yeah thousand uh, downloads. so you can help us get over that that last threshold and then the algorithms will start doing their algorithmic things and start algorithmically trying to put us out there into the world but we need your help and it's not going to happen without you so you know please if you enjoy what we're doing with all this time and effort we're giving to you hopefully you can help us out a little bit as well all right so um so Magic Fall, what what'd you think? I mean, we just spent the last what three and a half months, four months. I it it's been a journey. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, I think, um, and just show people the cover because I don't think we've done a cover reveal. Ooh. If you're only listening on the podcast, sorry, you're not gonna be able to see this, uh, and I'm not gonna describe it. Um, but head on over to YouTube. And, uh, you know, join the channel and or subscribe to the channel and share us and like us and all that. Yeah. So this is our uh, cover. Uh, we think it's quite cool. And the book is Magic Fall. And for me, this has been a very strange and re but rewarding experience. The world is a world I would have built. I, I could see myself building a world like this. But these characters would not be characters that I would normally have written. My, what would you call yeah. them before? <laughs> well, they're, they're pure characters. They're, yep. they're driven snow characters. Um, if you've read Sangwill Chronicles, you know that I tend more towards the grayer to shading into black side of characters. I don't write grim dark, but my characters are not heroic in the in the way that these two characters are. And if you read my stuff, you will know that I tend to write more heroic characters. Um, not that I don't write shades of gray; I've got plenty of that. But you know, I do always have, and I don't do it on purpose. It's just my writer's tick. But I always have one character who is very honorable and really trying to do the right thing. And and that is actually usually his Achilles heel that gets him into trouble or her into trouble or whatever. Um, but even, you know, if it is a hero character, like in the Genesis saga, we have a Lith who starts off as a emotionless, moral, moralless killing machine. Her growth is still learning why that is not the right way to be and ends up being a very heroic character at the end of her journey. Because I do... I am definitely the optimist when it comes to humanity. I want humans to be better than what we are. And so I like writing dark stories. This is not that, but I like writing dark stories and then putting good people in it and watching them try to figure out how to navigate those waters. So but, I was thinking yeah. <clears throat> I was thinking about how dark the story is. And I mean, it is serious. There, there is there is not only is there serious stakes, but you know, at least one of our characters is forced into the situation she's in, you know, through through some fairly through a fairly dark society. Mm -hmm. I consider this true YA. Mm. That's my definition of YA. I, I think the industry has completely ruined the definition of YA because there's still YA YA, but 
I also see a lot of porn in YA, and it's like I don't understand why you're labeling this as YA, uh, other than the fact that they're just they know that they're going to sell to horny little sixteen year olds. I still wanted this to be, you know, if we were going to do a YA thing, I want it to be my definition of YA, mm -hmm. which is, yeah, there's 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 a little rough language from time to time. It's not filled with it, but it, there's a, there's a few, you know, um, what's well, their version of an f bomb? It's not really our version of the f bomb, but there's a few dams and and mm -hmm. hells and and stuff like that. Um, and then there's some serious tear joke jerking kind of loss moments. There is, you have to deal with death. You, you know, I'm a big proponent of you, you can't take, it's like, and I think I've said this before, my, one of my first meetings with Sony, when I was talking about writing for, uh, EverQuest next, they were like, okay, so in the stories, how are you going to incorporate the fact that the, that the characters resurrect? I'm like, oh yeah, no, no, that's not happening in the, in the pros. I, if I kill a character, they're dead. Yeah. And they're like, no, 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 but the game. I'm like, I don't care about the game. Like, I care. I'm I'm a prose writer. I'm writing prose. I think if you have to have death, it has mm -hmm. to be there as the ultimate kind of thing to lose. Um, Resurrecting characters is a great way to lose re readers yeah. because you just you've just completely eliminated stakes from your game, right. from your from your book. Now, so. I do, I do. Even though I've will never resur even though I deal with nothing but magic. One of my rules in every single world is there is no such thing as is coming back from death. Mm. Death is death. Um, I say that, but if the cartoon gets made, there is a thing that happens in that. But it's also a Dick and Fart Show cartoon, so that's different. Um, <laughs> but I do subscribe to the soap opera method of if there's no body, then <laughs> maybe... <laughs> That's the thing, right? Hobbyist corpses. I mean, you you must subscribe to that as a fantasy author. If there's yeah. no body, there's no death. Like until well, you've seen the body, it's right. not dead. <laughs> right. Um, or it could be dead. It's sort of like yeah. Schrodinger's, you know, death. Yes. Uh, it may be dead. It may not be dead. We don't know until we actually physically look at. It. Yes, um, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, so that I will subscribe to that. Where, you know. If 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 I don't actually show you, but if I show you somebody's death, they ain't coming back. That character's exactly. never coming back in my world. Because I think that really does ruin the yeah. um the just the the you know, I've said this before when we talked about this, and it, it didn't ruin it for a lot of people, but it did ruin it for me. You know, I really hated then the cartoon. I know it's a dumb cartoon, but in Rick and Morty, when we find out that the Morty that we've been following isn't even the Morty, like he's died several times over and it's like it just even though it's the exact same character in every single way to me i know it's not the same character and so it was just like well then why do i care now yeah oh. so it does it, it it lowers the stakes it lowers the everything to me and i just it's a terror it's a generally speaking like i'm not saying you absolutely cannot make it work but generally speaking right. it is a terrible idea like, right <laughs> so but anyway so uh, we didn't even flirt with resurrection, really. Yeah. There's the what what's dead is dead. <laughs> um, and I really enjoyed this project. I um, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about plotting, which has been interesting. But I've also I think that you learned a lot about how plotting is not the end <laughs> like because when i look at our structures we changed a lot in the writing process also as the world built out so we when we started this the religion was a single line of uh they worship the builder we didn't have more than that that was it, it was just it was there to have a curse in in one chapter and then I decided, well, I, I needed to be a little bit more than that. So I built out the, the basics of the religion. And then um, it went from it went from that to suddenly being a much bigger part of the story. At the point where we decided that, okay, so there are two centers of power in Shadow City, and it's the council, the director's council, and the religion. Like those are the two centers because the religion also controls the magistrates. And that was the point. So the religion controls the law and the director's council 
uh, or the, the implementation of the law and the director's council controls the execution and the two combined make the laws. And that made the religion fundamentally part of the city. Now, it doesn't matter in this book because this book is not about the city, but it is going to matter a lot in the next book. And so we had to like do a little bit of backtracking and insert a few things and, you know, color things in and so on. And I and that to me was part of my normal process. It's how I wrote Sangwheel. It's how I wrote um, even the even the erotica. I think it's it, one of the things that you've said to me periodically through this was how much you learned about how much you actually pants. Yeah. So I just want to because the way you said that made me feel bad. I didn't learn how to pants yeah. during this because this is the, you know, everything you said is the same way I've been writing forever. What I learned was I just didn't realize how much I was actually discover writing in the moment mm-hmm. because, you know, when I'm writing by myself, uh, which was my way up until, um, you know, working with you and working with the guys with the realm, I don't notice. So I plot, plot, plot. And then when I'm in the pit of, the story as I need to come up with stuff, as I need to to filter through stuff, as I need to backtrack and add stuff. I I just did it. I never thought about the fact that, Oh, you are actually doing this discovery writer. And the reason why it never occurred to me was because I didn't need to communicate that to anybody else. It was just in my head. I would run across it. I, you know, like, let's say I had to add something. I've told the story where I had the, the magic bracelets on that one novella that I had to use. So I just kept writing as if they were there. And then I just went back and opened a couple of chapters. And I said, you know, in the notes, because I have a note section at the top of every one of them. And I said, add bracelets, add bracelets, add bracelets, so that I would remember to add them when I went back and did my edits. Um, What I learned is because now I have to communicate. I'm not the one necessarily writing all this stuff anymore. So I'm not going to be there in the moment while it's being produced. And so that's really was was the eye opener for me was I've always considered myself a very, 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 very heavy plotter, like probably one of the most heavy plotters that exist that can get a that can get a novel finish. I mean, there are there are people that plot more than me, but, you know, because you meet them at writers conference like, oh, yeah, I've been working on this fantasy novel for 14 years. You know, I'm still world building. I'm like, yeah, you're not really writing a novel, are you? <laughs> you're 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 <laughs> just you're just world building. Um, so. But what really was the eye opener was how much I do allow myself to just mold like water as and and we're that's I think the big thing we're going to talk about here is how many things we ran into where it was like, oh, wow, now that we're here in the weeds, this weed needs to look like this or act like this or be like this. And then that's going to to make this work. We might have to go back and add this little bit or add that little bit. So that's the big thing with me is now that I'm having to communicate I can't just take it from my head directly to paper. I've taken it from my head and disseminate it out to the, everyone that I'm working with that I was like, man, I really do a lot. I've always just called myself a hardcore plotter, but once I'm in the writing mode, I pants a crap ton. But I do think it helps me because I'm only pantsing the minutia. I'm pantsing details. I'm pantsing, you know, so, so you said that, but let's get into the weeds. So, this okay. was our planning for um for Act One of the story, and we're also going to discuss in this podcast. We're going to discuss something a reader asked us about, which is creating your story bible, which is basically your notes, and we're going to discuss what questions you should ask of a reader. So, I'll, I'll take you through what we've asked our beta readers in some questions. So the first scene from Buri's perspective stays more or less the same. Yeah. This one just changed really in execution. But Lyran's Lyran's first scene more or less the same. But after that, we start having some significant deviations, especially in Lyran's story. Because in our plotting, we had him farting around like basically he wasn't actually he was flip-flopping between his father he had no real motivation to go on the thing we were just like shoehorning him in there well and and also to to admit a fault i mean i think that was probably our biggest mistake that we made 
uh, during the plotting process, I don't think we really ever knew what his story was when we mm-hmm. started. We just had, but we, we were out of time. So by the time we got to, so really for me, I was like, well, whatever, it's act one. I don't really care about it because I'll figure it out, you know, once we get into act two, because mm-hmm. remember I was supposed to be writing Laron's, it ended up not working that way because of scheduling and everything like that. And, and mm-hmm. I just, I'm just, I've got, I've got too much on my plate. Um, so luckily Marie was awesome and wrote the first draft of everything, which was really good for me. Um, I guess I ended up writing three chapters, I guess we could say, <laughs> <laughs> but that was it. Um, so I, I just expected that once I learned later on through act two and act three, again, I didn't consciously think about this, but this is like, well, I'll just figure it out. I'll just pants it as I'm going through. But then I never pants it because I never wrote it. Yeah. So, so, so I, I mean, I that was a mistake though, but that was a huge mistake on our part. Mine, if you want to throw it completely on my shoulders or our part, whatever you want to say. Um, we didn't really know. We didn't plot a real good first act for, for Lyra. We didn't. But I also, I don't know if it would, like I would, it would not, I would not have been able to plot and the first act for Lyran without writing something right. from Lyran's perspective. Yeah. Because yeah, you're that... the one that actually figured it out. You were the one yeah. that came up yeah. with the mystery and the, the, the all that, and it yeah. laid out perfectly. Yes, but I could only do that after I had written Lyran's first chapter and into his second chapter, because I needed to get to know the character. And that right. is... To me, like we're, I'm, I'm busy with a, a little side project and whatever, and I haven't started the plotting process, not in full. I just have basic tent poles because I need to write the characters first. I cannot plot properly if I do not understand my characters. And the only way for me to understand my characters is to write something, not just their background, but to write from their perspective. That's the process that works for me. And <laughs> so I would never have been able to do Lyran's first um, act without doing a chapter from Lyran's perspective. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. And even then, we, you know, his personality changed a lot mm. as we move through the story. Uh, Burry's was pretty much hit the ground running solid. She's the same character that we thought she was going to be. Mm. Um, mm. but you had also written some of her and knew kind of where she was going. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I changed a few things or, you know, convinced you to change a few things and make her age lower and mm. some things like that. But, um, but for the most part, Burry is the character that Burry was going to be from yeah. the beginning to the end. Whereas I just think a mistake that we made, um, was not plotting layer on enough. Um, it turned out great. I mean, yeah. you know, the whole mystery thing that he goes through and all of that is fantastic and it ties in perfectly with everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, I don't think you would have come up with the, with that murder or that mystery and, and trying to figure that out if we hadn't had act two and act three and knew where they were going. No, Although act three, not. act three that is plotted here isn't even used. No, no, no. <laughs> act, act three, act three is nothing. Um, in fact, I, I can I can show you Act Three because it's not even a spoiler. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. We didn't even use this this entire Act we Three used, down. We used almost none of this. <laughs> right, right. Act Two is fairly yeah the same, but once we got into the weeds and really started figuring out major elements of Act Two, yeah. like it led us down to. But that's normal for me. I normally yeah. plot a book two or three times mm. um, because no plan survives contact with the enemy and the enemy is the writing when you get into the weeds and start writing that's when you're going to destroy your plot so if you're a plotter you cannot be rigid i mean you just can't you have to allow yourself to adjust i think my advice to a plotter would be to do your plotting and then start writing Mm -hmm. and then revisit your plan after each act because I think, like, for me, when I went 
I wrote the first part. I wrote Act One first, and then I stopped. I actually stopped in at, at the end of Act One, and I was like, I'm not happy mm-hmm. with Lyra's story because I'd written too much of this kind of outline that we've got here. So I actually went back and I rewrote huge chunks of Lyra's story to make it that murder mystery. Or well, not the murder mm-hmm. mystery, but the, the mystery element that he investigates. Um, and maybe you, maybe if you did like three or four or five passes of plotting, you could have done that. But maybe then it would also take you two years to write the book. You right. Know? Whereas exactly. this took us a couple of months. Like, <laughs> Well, but there's, you know, it's, it's funny you said that. It's the reason why, and for those that have seen my chapter breakdown sheets, mm-hmm. I actually, once I have the plot and I get those into those individual sheets... I write the chapter and then I edit the chapter's plot. And then I go, you know, with my first edit pass and then I edit the chapter plot. And then, so I'm really kind of, instead of going to the end of an act and then replotting, I'm actually almost replotting every single chapter. See, a chapter for Uh, me is too short. Like I need that chunk. I need that chunk of story to be like, does this chunk make sense? And it's the reason why I didn't even, like those are in our documents, but I didn't even like, I was like, just don't even, just ignore them. (laughs) <laughs> like, don't even go down there. Because um, I knew that wasn't the way that you were, it was going to be advantageous for you to work. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing. Everyone needs to, I guess that's the gist of this little nugget right mm-hmm. here. There is no right way to do it. There's just the right way for you. And so had I been the one writing all of the layer-ons, I would have been using that chapter breakdown sheet because I find it very helpful for me to go, okay, I don't really like the direction this character's going or, or what am I really doing here? How am I, how really am I going to get on track with this? Um, so I did I did occasionally use those breakdown sheets, but only in very specific circumstances where I was like, I'm not sure what I'm doing with this chapter. Let me break it down according to Drake's sheet and then tell Drake, Drake, what do you think of this breakdown? So I did that once or twice. But it was it it was a rare occasion where it was like That's why I like them, because they really do force you when you start mm-hmm. having to answer specific questions about a scene. Like, why is this the way it is? What are you trying to accomplish here? What is the motivation here? What What's the end game for the reader? What's the end game for the story? When you start actually having to answer all these really specific questions, you start to go, oh, okay. Now I understand what I'm doing and I understand why the direction I was going isn't hitting the numbers. Yeah. Um, and it allows you to really stay tight and on track. So I, I think that we we have written a very tight n- novel. One of the alpha readers who's actually finished the book, um, an alpha reader means they got to see it in first draft state. Um, so one of the alpha readers, uh, their feedback was um, that it's it's like Harry Potter or Hunger Games. You can't turn the pages fast enough, which is always, the, that's a sign of a tight book. Like right. it's not always what you want in epic fantasy because epic fantasy does tend to be denser but this is not epic fantasy so you do want that page turning effect yeah um but what is also interesting is so this is our scene breakdown if we go back to our original tent poles i mean we kind of have magic doesn't work quite right but that's not actually why she's poor Right. She's poor because her sister got sick and all of this, you know, so there's a lot of things that also change even between tent poles and the scenes and then the scenes and the final product. Mm. So don't be rigid. Don't Mm. marry your outline. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And then in terms of the, um, the Bible itself. So this is this section, which is called overview stuff very uh, sharp naming system there, is basically the rough notes of our world, all right? So there's like a, but you can see this is my first outline, yeah? So this was my very first outline was Buri Zuren is a magical baker who owes a great deal of money to a loan shark in the floating city. She is selected for the Nutty Fall team by means of the duty lottery um and he sends her to like sabotage her own city. Like that was the original plot. So it's a long way away from that. But yeah, because originally there were multiple cities. There were multiple cities. Yeah. <laughs> so, Not just multiple precincts within the same city. 
Yeah. So you can you can literally see the evolution of the plot and the world if you look through these old notes of ours as they go like that one to the tent poles to the scenes. And then I've got like I've got overview notes here, like the magic system and the world itself. Like my notes here, I would defy anybody else to make any kind of sense of it. And this is why I told uh, Drake to stick to the tab called Shadow World, because Maybe this summarize everything for me. <laughs> this tab, <laughs> this tab is basically my shorthand that is notes meant for me. <laughs> right. <laughs> Then I normally have a characters tab uh, where I have, I keep notes on here about especially associated names with a character. And that's so that I can spell it correctly. Right. Um, and so that I can look it up easily and make sure like, who's the, who's the sister? What does she look like? Et cetera, et cetera. How many, how many times when I was editing that I would like, I would just write a random <laughs> selection of letters and be like, yeah, just whatever this thing's name was or person's <laughs> name was or whatever. Uh, I would just highlight it and put a comment on it. Like, yeah, whatever. Like, I, think I couldn't. The best, I, I think the best was your misspelling of Hephaestus. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't remember Hephaestus, so I just kept like, I don't know. I'm sure I wrote hippopotamus one time. <laughs> like, I don't. I'm just like, whatever. What, whatever this name is, I'm not going to go look it up. I don't have time. I'm just editing. You know, it was that was fantastic? Then yeah. The one thing I did with teacup was I gave his sounds basic meanings um, just so that I didn't continuously use like the same kind of meow and so on, because I did put in vocalizations for the cat. There are two schools of thoughts on that, whether you should vocalize pets or not vocalize pets. I felt that it added something to have some vocalization from the cat. So I put it in. He's also a pretty intelligent cat. He is a pretty intelligent cat. And then there's Lyran, and uh, this is my builder's builder's necklace, and this is Vinya, his father. So yeah, so you've got like those kinds of things. Then this is my rough notes on Shadow City, the precincts, and so on. You can see they're mostly just names. Now we come to the actual world. Okay, so my world building might be more than most people want. I don't know. Like, I don't know to what extent most people will build, and I don't know to what depths they will build, and I don't know how long it takes them. So I can only speak for myself. I built this world in three months. The The world is hydrogen rich, and that uh, that actually took me the longest to research. Because you've got because... a lot of actual science in here. Yes. Yes, yeah, so it took me it took me a while to grapple with science fiction world building, even though this is science fantasy and I could hand wave a lot of it. I felt like it would detract from the world to do too much hand waving. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of research into what kind of life would evolve on a hydrogen world and how that life would work. And then how you could work with Earth life. And that led me to the wonderful world of supersymmetry, which is a theoretical particle that people theorize could exist, but we have not yet found. However, because I'm writing science fantasy, you know, my like there's now supersymmetry in the world and it's manipulatable and it can do all of the wonderful things that supersymmetry supposedly would be able to do because it, it's basically like a, <laughs> like a um a quantum inverse kind of effect. And a hundred years from now, somebody's gonna find this book and go, wow, look at these guys. They actually predicted where we were gonna be now. <laughs> As they teleport through walls and all sorts of crazy crap. Yeah. But what the supersymmetry and the hydrogen and everything else gave me was so the hydrogen, especially, was a very interesting thing because hydrogen is explosive, but only when you have a lot of oxygen. So what this hydrogen allowed me to do was it allowed me to have um, fire-breathing creatures that don't set everything on fire because there's not enough oxygen in the environment to set everything on fire. Um, and so that's why I've got like all of these biomes. Uh, oh, what I do with my with my OneNote is I organize things so that I can um, 
you're like, okay, I want to see a bird, for example, um, or I want to see a uh this these are things that I actually used. You can see I created a lot more creatures. This is a float weave of spider that carries its net above it and stuff like that. So I did a lot, I did a lot of physical world building, which is more than I would normally do, because normally I just use a world kind of like ours. I don't normally create all of these creatures, but the nature right. of the world. And then I always have a technology sex sex section. So what is the technology level at? What are the special things that I use? So I've got here my sin sticks, hollow display, survival suits, et cetera, et cetera, weapons, et cetera. And then we come to the big one, the culture. So I have race relations, the floating cities, the religion. The religions actually got a huge write-up, including the expressions that they use. Um, there's some, there's a, a myth here that's important. There's uh, uh, the cult of Helios, which is a different thing, which also has its like myths and beliefs and so on. Then there's how the governments work, especially with the precincts and their client districts. And then there's the, the precincts outlines. So that is what I would put in a world Bible. Yeah. And then for the story Bible, you add the details of the characters, write some backstories for the characters, make sure you know their motivations. Uh, everything like that. There's one thing I wanted to add from something you were saying earlier, because when we were talking about the two cities, because this should happen, literally, I I just had this discussion with my boss with the video game that I'm working on. Um, and we had this discussion, you know, through the plotting. And then I can't tell you how many times I've had this with private clients or, you know, students or whatever. And that's where I talk about anything you're going to add to a story is going to add two things to it. It's going to add complexity and it's going to add complications. And we want complications because complication is where we derive our drama from, our conflict from. But every time you add a complication to the story, something's in the way, can't do something, whatever, there's complexity to it. Mm. And so I don't think enough people think about this. So like the two, the cities was a great example because that was our first conversation about that. You were, because, because, that's a natural idea. There's nothing wrong with the idea of going, oh, no, there are, you know, four cities and each one of them has a team going for this naughty fall because of this. And literally, that's logical. That's literally there's nothing wrong with that idea until I come along and go, yeah, but what is it? That's a lot of complexity that we have to write to explain that there's these four cities and they're in different locations and blah, blah, blah. And where did they come from? And blah, blah. What does the story gain out of it from a, you know, conflict point? You know, what is what is the complications that are added to the story? I'm not talking about complications to the world or how complicated it is to to write that stuff. I'm talking about complications for the story. And then once I broke it down to you like that, you were like, oh, man, that that really is going to be more work than the benefit to the story is going to give. And then we toned it down to just one city, but multiple precincts within that city. And so I don't think people writers put enough emphasis on that every time you come up with something you should take a step back and go okay but what does this do for the story compared to how much of the story i'm going to have to dedicate to explaining this and again just had this conversation yesterday you know with the with my video game um i just don't think a lot of writers think about about it like that and it's it's how you make your story tight by constantly balancing out how much complication is this complexity giving me? Is it is the complexity less than the complication? Then, okay, great. Is the complexity way more than what the complication and help for the story is going to be? Then that's too, it's too complex. I need yeah. to, to tone it down. I need to change it. I need to look at it differently, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, so I think that's an important thing. Um, and that was about it. I mean, because the rest of it, I don't think everything else fit really, really well. Um, I think that was the only thing, but again, there's nothing wrong with what you had come up with. I mean, I would have done the same thing. Like, yeah, of course you have four cities. Like, why wouldn't you have four cities? Yeah. Um, but then once you start looking at the story that you're actually telling, you're like, ah. because that's the thing, like a world, this is why I always, when people tell me they've been working on their world for 10 years, I'm like, okay, you've been working on your world for 10 years and you haven't written a book in it you have now overdeveloped the world because mm -hmm. it is now inflexible and mm -hmm. unchangeable. You, 
don't don't sit on a world and think it's going to breed a story. Right. Write the story and let the world support it. Right. It's different from role playing. Role playing is a different story. So if you're building right. for role playing, completely different. Okay. If you're building for role playing, build in all the hooks. Go for it. Go crazy. Spend ten years. Whatever. Like that's fine. Because role playing worlds are supposed to have multiple hooks that players can interact with. Remember, with role playing, it's not about the character. It is about the world and the plots. Right. But with stories, write the story. It will tell you much more about the world than spending infinitesimal amount of time, spending time on building the details of the world. And that's basically what you did. I don't, and I don't think anybody is going to make this connection unless I point out to them. You just said it took me three months to make the world, but we only worked on this start to finish for about four months. So they happen simultaneously because the story helped you on your side of things, create the world. It wasn't that you created a world and then you tried to create a story within that world. We were creating the story and then that, knowing where the story needed to happen is what allowed you to go, okay, well then the world needs to have this to enhance that or the world, ooh, look at this idea, which would add complication to the story without much complexity having to write it and so on and so forth. So the even world the, comes from the story, not the, the other biomes. Way. Even the biomes that are created, right? We have the prism leaf forest because that's right around the landing zone from the elevators. This is followed by the grasslands because grasslands lead into badlands. Badlands lead us to the pyrophyra groves because they're important for our world building elements. The pyrophyra are a central part of our kind of whole story, the, the blaze trees, as they're called in the story. Mm -hmm. um, because everything does have a Latin name and a normal name because, of course, it does because I am obsessive. <laughs> It's another reason why I really enjoyed working with this on you because I don't, I would never do any of that crap. Um, like I just yeah. make up stuff. I don't use real research and science. I'm way too lazy for that. So the proper so, yeah, name for, was... a, for a blaze tree is Pyrophyra arboris, but uh, everybody calls it a blaze tree. But yeah, so every, every um, thing was there because that is what the characters are traveling through. I right. built some creatures that I didn't use, but that was just to get an idea of how evolution had influenced various creatures. Like, what would a wolf be like? What would a this be like? What is this niche being filled with, et cetera, et cetera. So obviously there's things but that I didn't also, use. But it also is, is story hooks that could have been used. Yes. It's not like you made them up to just throw them away. You mm. made them up thinking that maybe there would be an opportunity, but... But that's and so that's fine. We're not saying don't create stuff that you're not going to use. What we're saying is, you know, again, the world building needs to come out of the story, not yeah. the story coming out of the world building. Um, there are definitely the more biomes than the ones I've created here. Right. Shadow is a planet. It is a big planet with a slightly higher atmospheric pr pressure than ours. There are mountains. There are valleys. There, there's all kinds of weird biomes. I created the ones that the characters travel through. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't go to a swamp, so you didn't create a swamp biome. Exactly. So, so yeah, that that I don't know if you would put in much more than that in your world bible side. In here on the characters, I was probably light on like my motivations and so on, but since we only had two POVs, they're easy to keep in your head. Um, you know, yeah, but so I even do all my secondary characters. And so yeah. for my story Bibles, um, I can open up the the realm. I won't share it, but well, just... look, I I can I can also show like my on on Sky, I mean Sky uh, my, my hidden blade, Sangwil Chronicles is ridiculous in that aspect. Uh where is my Sangwil arc? No, no, what am I looking for? The arc. So here, again, I've got um, all of my secondary characters. In here, POVs, only Isabella and Louis. Um, here, the threesome, the only POV is Naira. Um, then I've got like support cast, who these people are. Um, and I've got Sense because I have a blind character. Um, and it's very important to have all of these details when you're talking about a big book. Right. Same thing with Genesis Oblivion, same thing with everything else, right? Um, but with this, 
the secondary characters were they went by pretty fast you know what i mean right um, yeah, and see my portfolios are just bigger even on my yeah. tertiary characters i'll put their mannerisms their mm. foibles their motivations their um you know i have a whole character sheet basically that i put all this stuff in for each one of them so I, yeah so I, on the realm I, I do that only for the court for the courtier characters where i really need to understand their motivations at a very deep level um and that i keep in an excel spreadsheet because it's easier <laughs> yeah. i don't know i like i like doing the tertiary characters because you know again and i think i told this story um already but like i had that one scene where i had a main character basically think about it like a magic school so she's got to do something at night she's on a night duty she's run down she slept through dinner and in the plot i had you know she just runs through and the cook tries to convince her to get something to eat and really why is that in there it's to show that she skipped dinner that's it that's the only reason why it's there it's not there for really any major reason just to set the time set where she's at emotionally you know we've all been hungry we've all missed a meal and so that's all it's there but when i created the character portfolio for the cook like the one of her unique quirks was she always knows everyone's favorite food and has it ready for them at all times and so now when i wrote the scene she comes down and and she's like, hey, you missed dinner. It's like, I don't have any time. And now the cook's like, I have some blah, blah, blah. And she's mm -hmm. like, oh, you know what? Yeah. I, can I take it to go? Of course you can, dear. And it just, it, it makes that cook feel like the cook is not a part of the story at all. But that little hook, I wouldn't have come up with that probably on the fly without sitting down and thinking about it. Um, and she is the cook in this girl's dorm, so she could appear in future stories. I don't know. Um, so that's why I like doing stuff like that. It just it adds hooks. And if I never use it, sort of like the, the creatures that you created that we never use, it still it could be used. It could be. So so the thing with tertiary characters for me is I do keep them in mind, which is why I note down their names. But normally I just have like a one word reminded to myself of the intent here with, around them right. um so i tend to put in something like humorous or um flirty or fun or dour or whatever so that i remember what their basic like setup is because that's what i really need to understand about right. their relationship yeah and again there's no wrong answers in this it's mm. obviously we're on two sides of an extreme here you need mm. to figure out you as in the the audience needs to figure out where you think that you're going to be comfortable with. You know, yeah. I like a little bit more depth and, and I only do it really to the characters. Like I don't do it to creatures. I don't do it to, you know, the, again, she goes much more onto the, the physical world building stuff than me. And I'm much more interested in, you know, cause everything I write is character driven. Everything is, is about that, including my tertiary characters. They're the heroes in their story. They're just in my story as a tertiary character. So mm -hmm. I do want every character to feel, like they're just vibrant and big. Um, and that's just you, you know, we're each different writers. We have our own focus that we focus on and everything like that. Um, but it's one of the reasons why, like one of the things that I have always been docked for, especially by the publishing industry who want some of this stuff so they can make extra money on merchandising. They're like, why didn't you describe what their, what their dress looks like or what their pants look like or what their suit looks like? You know, we ran into that on the very first chapter where I was like, He's wearing a white suit and that was it. And you're like, no, 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 no. And you're like, this is what the buttons look like. And this is what the lapels look like. And this is what the <laughs> epaulets look like. And this is what the, and it's great. It literally adds this great layer to the story that is important, but that's just the difference between what I focus on. And that's why I always tell my fans, one of the things that I will use for teaching history is paintings. So there's I, I write paintings in one of two ways i'll write and then you walk down the hall paintings lining the inside wall or something like that or i'll write he walked down the hall stopped and this is what he saw in the painting and if i ever describe a painting i'm telling you you need to pay attention to that because there is a story reason why i am actually describing this painting um because otherwise i don't care I don't describe you did the same thing when you came back behind me with with even like the office you went into so much more detail of of what the carpet looked like and i just say i don't care what the carpet looks like so, it's just carpet. so it, it makes me sound like a fashion plate 
Um, and and honestly, I, I generally I am not. I I wear uh, sweatpants and a, a t shirt most days. Um, I That's you know. Funny. I'm I'm not actually interested in clothing. The reason why I describe clothing, the reason why I describe um, pictures, carpets, everything else, is because it's world building. Right. Yeah. And, no, it adds to the story. Yeah. Nothing wrong yeah. with it. Because every like all of the upalets that Lyran and upalets have become the way we show rank in our world because it's it's a culture based on militarism. So all of the upalet, it was important. The house sigils are important. The you know, the his mother's picture is important, like the whole, like all of those elements. And that's why I tell people, like, don't think of it in terms of you describing your character's clothing. Think of it as in terms of you are building your world. What 100%. does this stuff mean? Right. And I agree with that. But yeah. I mean, like, this is a great juxtaposition between the two of us. You spent more time adding that to my stuff and i spent more time adding just human emotion emotion <laughs> uh to your stuff because and and it's not that i don't write this other stuff in even my solo work i just have to work at it i have mm -hmm. to actually think about it just like you know you do also add the emotional stuff but i'm coming behind you on the on your first raw draft where you're just doing what you're comfortable right you know mm -hmm. with which is why my first draft doesn't have any of that stuff because i'm not comfortable mm -hmm. and it's not comfortability that's a, probably the yeah. wrong word I don't think about it. You don't think about it. You know, you're mm -hmm. you're concentrating on certain aspects of the story that you're that you're more yeah. interested in writing, I guess, would be a way to say it. So we're very, it's not we're like very complimentary. Was... Sorry. Yeah. We're very complimentary no. because I I focus very much on the world mm -hmm. um and how you show that to the reader. And I have an aversion for info dumps like mm -hmm. i despise info dumps so if you read my stuff be aware that you are not going to have info dumps the world is not going to be explained and you need to pay attention because <laughs> right. the explanation might be in a painting <laughs> yep um yeah and i'm the exact same way it's just that i focus on the internal mm. story um and so yeah you what you said about us being complimentary i think mm -hmm that has been the biggest joy for me in working on this yeah. is because the things that I struggle really hard with and, and not that it's mm. I have to just think about it. I have to pay attention mm. to it I, when I mean struggle I just mean I have yeah. to put effort into it it's effortlessly for me to write this heart-wrenching scene mm. where the character pours his soul out or loses mm. the most um, you know precious thing it's mm. the the scene where uh one of the characters dies uh mm. comes to mind um it, and it's a secondary character and you know you wrote the scene and it was a death scene it was kind of sad and then i was like yeah no i'm gonna make you cry <laughs> like i want i want it to be heart-wrenching um and so there's just a lot more yep. i just bring that you know that's what yep. i'm focused on and i enjoy writing um so yeah i think we were very complimentary and so now everybody gets gets both and much quicker because we could each just lean on our strengths yeah and not have to worry about the other side because we trust the other person to lean on their strengths to do to do all that other stuff. Exactly. So, yeah, really, no, really it, enjoyed that. It, it it was it was massively. So I just want to like do just want to take a look briefly at our chapter nine, um, where Buri actually encounters a magistrate, which is a priest, and to specifically kind of highlight how this world building stuff came together, right? I'm just going to read. So um, as she comes into this place, she's like, the um, a magistrate priest stopped her at the barrier leading to the elevators. His white robes partially obscured by the weight of silver and gold embroidery featuring the builder's life and sacrifice. Buri picked out the image of the builder teaching the half-adapted how to use Jiren while the priest checked the status of her chip. The god's outstretched hand pointed at another scene, this one showing the battle of the echoing spires, where he had defeated Helios' attempt to turn the music of Jiren against humanity. Okay, so that's the paragraph, right? That is based on this myth over here, the battle of the echoing spires. 
So you can see I wrote the whole myth, but in the end, what made it into the story is just that one line of like, this is the right. echoing spies myth. Because you don't info dump. Yes. <laughs> because, and why? Why is this? Because none of this is important to the story at that moment. Will this stuff come into book two or book three? Maybe. There, Maybe. there very might easily could be a spot for these, especially knowing where the story is going. Hmm. But in that moment, all th that would weigh the story down. It would do nothing for the story. It, it's not a part of the moment. Um, even though the Battle of the Echo Experience is interesting and a cool little event that happened and, and this other stuff, none of it matters for the story that we're telling. And so, yeah, that's how... All that, I, all that I wanted there was to show what the priest's robes look like, that they show these stories. And I wanted to show that there is one myth about the builder. So right. I had this myth. <laughs> and when I'm teaching my world building class, the way I say it is like this. If you're making a soup and you put in a pound of salt into the soup, it's not going to be good soup. If you put no salt in the soup. It's not going to be good soup. You have to put the right amount. And it's usually very little. And that's that's with all spices. And that's the way I see world building in storytelling. You want to have a bucket of salt in the cabinet because you're going to use it for other things. But when you're putting it into the actual dish of the scene, you want to put just enough to give it flavor. Any more and it overpowers it. And yeah. so it really is like spicing food. You use it very sparingly. Almost no world building stuff is going to make it into the story that you create. If you do a, a lot of creation, um, you're just going to take bits and pieces of it and you're just going to sprinkle it in. And it's going to add flavor and, you know, depth and everything else. And it's going to make the the read so enjoyable. Interestingly, that uh, that myth foreshadows a lot about book two. It does. It does. <laughs> Um, which I didn't know at the time when I created the myth. Funny how these things work out. That's usually work the way out. it works. That's <laughs> yeah. usually the way it works. Cause, yeah, because so, we had a general idea when we plotted out the trilogy, we had a general idea of what book two was going to be. And it's still kind of generally that way. But yes. because we learned so much and expanded so much through book one, mm. um, it made book two sort of like, just like act three. Like we yeah. plotted act three out for book one. But once we got there, it was like, this is there's so much of a not better story there's a better story to tell yeah and that's the thing about not being rigid so again for you plotters out there you cannot be rigid it doesn't matter that you created it it only matters what's good for the story once you get into the weeds and if you have to throw away months of work oh well throw it away it's not a big deal all that matters is the end product that the reader is going to consume doesn't matter what you had to do to get to that end product just the end product is the only thing that matters. Now, I also want to say something to Panthers, you know, who are who are my tribe, my uh, my homies. Um, you've got to be prepared to go back and to fix stuff and to rewrite stuff, because when we when I read it, Act Three, I didn't really plan Act Three. I just wrote it, right, based on on a vague outline of where we were and and everything else, and I had to go back and fix some things in act two in order to make act three work. I didn't have to fix a lot, but in Sangwill Chronicles, for example, book three, I rewrote co almost completely in the end. So I wrote the book twice. If you're a pantser, you cannot think that because you have written the chapter, you're done. Just like a plotter can't think, I've plotted it, the plot's done. Don't do that, don't marry your writing until it's published <laughs> like pantsers and plotters alike <laughs> well i mean plotters have to go back too because things yeah. are going to change um but i think and and maybe i'm being um um self-flagellating that's not that's not the word i'm probably looking for what, what's the word i'm looking for i don't think it's self-flagellating um, self-flagellating means beating yourself up right the, the opposite of that uh self crag uh boastful maybe um that's a word for it self boastful but uh self congratulatory self -congratulatory. i think is okay. the word i was looking for but anyway 
one of the things that I think is so great about plotting at the level that we did is that when you do make these radical changes, I think that's what, I mean, look at the two differences where you're like, I had to rewrite an entire book, whereas I just had to go back and add a couple little things. Sure. But the the reason why I had to go back and rewrite the book was because I reached the end and I was like, I did not spend enough time on the religion. Right. I did not. I have to go back and fix it. Um, right. And that added too much volume right. for book one, for one book. Right. And because it added too much volume for one book, I then had to put in a different conclusion. And that's why I had to. But, yeah. you know, so I did reuse a lot of what I'd already written, but I had to I had to write chapters of new content. Yeah, uh, I'm just saying that I think I'll, yeah. when you do plan out as much as you can, knowing that it's going to change, yeah. the change seems to be less for me than when I just pant something and I don't have a plan. And then I am I get to the end. I'm like, well, I have to, I, I love this ending now, but everything I wrote to get here is now garbage and I have to completely redo everything as opposed to having at least a structure. And now you're just changing out, you know, brace here or brace there. Yeah. You add this little bit. I mean, there, there was at least twice that I can remember through this where I'd run into a problem with mm -hmm. Magic Fall and I go, okay, I'm not going to mention it to her because I think this is going to take some serious rewriting. And then I would think about it for a day and I come back, and go, okay, here's my problem. And actually to fix it, if you go to this chapter and add this one little line, it's fixed. <laughs> and it's like, it ended up being this little, these little minor things that needed to be done to really smooth everything out. I think the one other thing, um, I think it also depends on like how you world build. If you world build predominantly through your characters, I don't know if you can fully plot. Because if you can't world build without your characters experiencing the world, then you can only put together the kind of most generic details of the plot. Because you can't put in the depths of your world. So you have to be able to world build to some degree without your characters, without writing. Because some people pants, not for the story's sake, but for the world's sake. Right. And if that's you, 100%, be aware that you're probably going to end up rewriting a lot. Like, well, I think that's the reason why that style of writer works so well in like a murder mystery set yeah. in our world, because the your your world building is kind of done for you because you grew up in the world. Yeah. Um, or maybe it's set in the 1920s and you got to do a little research, but it's still, I mean, the 20, 1920s wasn't that different from 2020. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't have the internet. You know, there's things like that. But um but for the most part, it's still humanity and earth and, and everything else. And so a little bit easier to 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 kind of get away with that when you're focusing on it like that. But yeah, for a, a hardcore epic fantasy world or a soft sci-fi world like we've created here, although you put a bunch of hard sci-fi elements into it, um, I would still consider this a soft sci-fi. No, me too. I, I, I would not. I, I, I am not exposing this world to the fans of hard sci-fi and telling mm -hmm. them it's hard sci-fi. Mm -hmm. I have met those people. They know more than I do about science. I do not want to argue with them. <laughs> I want to be able to say I hand waved it. <laughs> if, if anyone, if anyone comes up, I'm going to tell them the same thing about, um, you know, those people that get killed uh, swimming with orcas and they're just like shocked. And I'm like, yeah, killer whale, the killer is in their name. Yeah, I'm going to be like, um, magic fall. Magic? In the name of the type. Magic. The the <laughs> <laughs> right there. It, it's not science fall. <laughs> you know. So. No. Um, so one of the questions, one of the things that one of the readers asked us about was our uh, beta question. So I just want to take you guys through this um, beta question template as the last thing on this List. So yep. this is our beta questions for chapter 18. The first four, the first three questions are the same. Yes. Was there something on the opening page that pulled you in and gave you the, the desire to continue reading? And what was it? Okay. What this question is about is establishing the entry hook of the scene of the chapter. What convinces the reader that, yes, I want to continue reading this chapter now? Because the, as a writer, you put something in there that you think is going to hook them. Mm. But the only way to test that out is to get people to read it and ask them, 
what and, and and you can't do this is why you cannot do baited questions you can't go so when laron stubbed his toe was that what made you want to continue reading like you don't know it's it's just was there something there and if there was what was it like mm -hmm. you allow them to tell you what it was and then if they're like oh it was when laron stubbed his toe you're like okay all right that's what i thought it was going to be that's what you guys say it is so obviously i did my job right yeah then the second question is the same question, but for the entire chapter. Okay, so the first one is on the opening page. The second one is for the entire chapter. What grabbed you and made you want to continue not only reading, but a desire to read the next chapter? So what is the hook through to the next chapter of this character? Again, no. you've put it in there, but you got to get other people to tell you whether you succeeded or not. Yeah. Remember, you need a hook at the top and a hook at the bottom. Otherwise, people are going to read the scene and stop. Mm -hmm. So um, then the third question, which is the same for all chapters, is were you able to visualize the entire scene? Were there any details I could elaborate on to help you picture the scene better? And that is just like scene painting. Do you understand what you saw? Everything else. So this question um, for me is to overcome the fact that you're writing two books, you're writing one on paper and one in your head, and you don't know that you seamlessly combine the two. So you when you reread it, you see both books. But when you give it away, you're only giving away the paper book. So that's their ability to go. Yeah, you didn't describe this dude at all. And you're like, what are you talking about? I know exactly what he looks like. Oh, it's not on paper. It's in my head book. And so that's really what that's there is to help you see when you've described something in your head, but you have not described it on paper. Yeah. Then uh, for this chapter, there's a couple of specific questions about what's happening in this chapter. So one of them that I, this is the chapter where they find the noddy. So I'm like, you've now seen the noddy. It's been described to you. Did you realize what it was before this? Was seeing it satisfying? Did it kind of meet your, your thought process? Then um, Buri and Lyra decide here to follow a, a caravan. I ask that their decision makes sense to you. Did that it that it gel with what you know of the characters and so on? That the motivation makes sense. And again, just ask, to add to that, just mm -hmm. to add to that, it's because we think we are making you know logical decisions for our characters, but until you ask somebody else, you mm -hmm. don't know if you succeeded or not. And then um, what do you think of their relationship now? Now, I put in this question in most of our chapters as I go along with it, because once once the characters have met, because their relationship and how it changes is a core part of the second half of the book. So um, I want to know after each chapter, what do the beta readers and the alpha readers think of their relationship? Then there's questions that are the same. So besides those questions, there's questions that are, again, the same for every chapter. So at the end, what questions does this chapter leave you with that you want answers to? So this is both a world building and a plot question. Like, do you think we're on Earth? Do you think we're, you know, what, what do you want answers to? Well, and the big reason why I ask this question is this is how I start using the readers against themselves because once you get into the mentality of the readers so like if, when i see my beta readers are all going man i really need to know this or i really want to know that i can now use that information against them to either entice them to continue reading because i'm dangling that carrot in front of them or if i get to the point where i know that 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 not knowing this information is now might become painful i can give them the carrot you know at that moment or whatever and so that's why this this question is so important to me because this allows me to make sure that the tension in the story and the mystery of the story is at the exact right level that you are really dying to know something else, but you're not dying so much that it's painful because now it's like, well, screw it. I don't even care anymore. Like yeah. if you're going to treat me like this, then I don't want to know. It's like I, I read the story uh, once, um, an unpublished story where basically – they, they kept being like this character kept saying for like four chapters how she has an awesome plan, you know, to beat the villain. She said that for four chapters straight by the fourth chapter without ever telling me what the plan is. Right. So they're just showing me like little prep, little preparation. But by the end of the fourth chapter, I was like, this plan better be 
the best plan in the history of clever plans. And of course it wasn't. Like after that much build up, nothing, nothing would live up to expectations. Right. So, so <laughs> you yeah. need to, you know, and I say this all the time in my classes, storytelling is really a form of manipulation. Now, I think it's an honorable form of manipulation because we're manipulating our readers to have a good time and to enjoy themselves. Mm. However, that is why, you know, this is a question that that I created years and years and years and years ago. And it was a way to get inside the psyche of the reader so that I can manipulate them better so that they have a better time. Again, it's an honorable form of manipulation. I hate using the term manipulation, but it, that's what I'm doing. I manipulate people into really getting immersed in the story and having a great time with it. And so that's what this question is there to help me to do. Because while I can, again, all of these questions are designed because I, I've i done what I thought is the right thing to, you know, all those other questions. And this one, I've manipulated the readers the way I think that that they should be manipulated. But until you get it out there, Drake's rule of 10, get 10 people that don't care about you to read about it, to read it and, and give you feedback. That's really how I know whether I've succeeded or not. Um, because we definitely want to get this feedback from a small group of beta readers who are not on the internet, you know, literally um, reviewing you live on Amazon that's going to be there forever. You know, if you've made a mistake, you get this group that's like, man, you really boxed this. This chapter sucks and you totally lost me or you totally threw me out of the story or you like, I would put the book down at this point. Mm -hmm. It's much better to hear it then and go, oh, let me redo this. Let me change this and get it back to them. See if that fixes the problem mm -hmm. as opposed to just going, oh, no, I'm awesome. I'm God. I'm mm -hmm. I'm the best at everything. And you get out there and then you get a hundred people on Amazon going, yeah, chapter seven, I just put the book down because it was so terrible. It threw me so far out of the story. And I don't recommend that you read this. I give it one star. Like mm. much better to have your beta readers tell you that than to have the world have that permanently as a record. And then um, you've got, so so that's the question. And then the most important questions is, would you at any time stop reading this? If so, where and why? Like, which did this, did you finish the chapter? If you, did you have any inkling of not finishing it? It's an important so, question. The funny thing is, I've actually removed those questions from my okay. chapters. I f after they've been in my beta or my chapter breakdown sheet for literally 15 years. And I just took them out in the last couple of months because I started realizing that they're very redundant. If I get the answers above it, because I never noticed it before, but they're always the same answer here as they were up above. So I eventually I took them out yeah. because they're kind of redundant. Um, yeah. And I, but I've just recently done that, so you haven't yeah. even seen that new sheet. Yeah, so um, I mean, the, these two questions are basically just like a consolidation of above. Would you really stop are. reading this? Um, if you finished it, do you what does it make you want to continue reading? And then the last question is anything you want to add or say about the chapter, right? And then yeah, the giving them a spot for open feedback is vitally yeah. important because you again you're coming up with these questions. So mm. you think these are the right question to ask, but there could be something just really dying that the reader wants to say. But if you don't ask them, they're not going to volunteer. I mean, that's the thing. They don't want to hurt your feelings. They don't want to step on your toes. They don't want to whatever. And if you if you never really ask them those open new questions, they're just going to be like, well, I really kind of wanted to say this, but eh, I guess I guess it's fine. And I'd rather get that feedback. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, so this is just the, the chapter breakdown, like who the POV is, the synopsis of the, the chapter, major theme questions, if you like include all of this stuff. Yeah. Drake uses this. I generally don't. What I used was I used some of those plot point breakdowns and sometimes mm -hmm. the reversals. <laughs> yeah, I go way above and beyond in yeah. my plotting. And I know that um, I just, I don't know. I tend to like all that information. It really helps me focus down on what each chapter needs to accomplish. Yeah. So um, that that was us writing Magic Fall, I guess, and what we put in our World Bible and what our beta questions looked like. And it was massively enjoyable. Yeah. Like it was a blast. I think this, I think the story has turned out fantastic. I think everyone's gonna have a great time reading it. Um, it's definitely you know a lot lighter than either of our stuff normally is, which I think is a good thing. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Not that it isn't serious, not that it doesn't have, you know, real world implicate, you know, complications and implications for Mm -hmm. the characters and everything like that. But it isn't like it, 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 it's got good themes and it's got like, it explores questions and all the rest of it, but it is a, I don't want to say a lighter story because I mean, it, I don't want to make light of the characters because you know they they do go through stuff, but it's a it's not as Heavy. it doesn't have as much meat, I guess, as the as the themes in in Sangwheel and the themes in Genesis Oblivion and so. On. Do we know? Do we know the final word count? It is sitting. It's actually at ninety thousand now. Okay. All right. Yeah. Just on ninety. So basically, standard entry level fantasy mm-hmm. <laughs> size. Yeah. Bigger um, than the first Harry Potter book. Yeah. Yeah. I want to say it was 75 or 80. Yeah. Maybe 85. I don't remember. It's been too long, but I remember it was somewhere around in there. Yeah. But I mean, we're, we're on a secondary world. Um, You know, you, you have to go into much more detail. Right. Can't wait for you guys to get it. We should put it on pre-sale. We should have it up for pre-sale. Um, it's going to be, um, we're going to pre-sell it through Starman Rider Studio. And Amazon. The well, I'm saying if they want autographed copies, yeah, yeah, ordered directly from us. I mean, that's the beautiful thing is we're we got the print run coming here. Mm-hmm. You're coming here. We're gonna spend yeah. at least a day autographing books and everything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, while we're sitting around talking about the next book, we can be signing this book. Um, but yeah, so pre-sale should happen in about two weeks uh on starvingwriterstudio.com. Uh, if you go to Magic Fall, what is what what's Magic Fall novel? Magic uh, I will Fall put novel. the link into the description, but it is magicfallnovel.com. So there'll be a link to the Starving Writer Studio store um, from there if you want to go there. So if you're not going to be at Comic Con and you want a signed copy of the book, then hit Magic Fall Novel. And I will make sure that we have a link up there to Starving Writer Studio and you can pre-order the book right. when this podcast comes up. And whatever's left here after Comic-Con and after the pre-orders, we're going to have all those signs. So we will have some signed by both of us in our American warehouse. Um, but I think that we're doing it all through America, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so once this first print run is gone and we get the second print run unless Marie comes back to visit me. Um, this is the way to get Marie signature in the book is to pre-order. So just be aware of that. Yep. Or you can go to Finland on vacation. Yeah. You can bring me the book. Let me know where you are in Finland. And I'll, I'll meet you somewhere and sign your book for you. <laughs> Cause, Cause Finland's not that big. <laughs> 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 so seems like you could have lunch in one side of the country and dinner on the other side of the country. Uh, not quite. It's it's about a thousand kilometers. So breakfast on one side of the country and dinner <laughs> on the other side of the country. Um, yeah, but no, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, can't wait to get this out to everybody. Yeah, and that has been our post-mortem on writing Magic 4. We hope that you've enjoyed it. We hope that you will enjoy the book. And we will see you soon for another one. Bye.